Hi, it's Peter here with RGB Filter, and we're talking to Robin Laws, a prolific game designer and author, uh, who recently published uh, Hamlet's Hit Points, a treatise on uh, beat analysis of uh, Shakespeare as applied to role-playing games. Yeah, what it does is it takes three classic narratives. Uh, first of all, Hamlet, of course, also the movie version of Dr. No, and uh, the classic film Casablanca and shows you how stories work by looking at those stories beat by beat, moment by moment, uh, with the objective of showing uh, game masters and players how to infuse those same emotional rhythms into a uh, role-playing experience that authors and screenwriters and playwrights do when they create works of fiction because uh, story sort of entered role-playing through the back door and we haven't subjected it to the level of analysis that we have to encumbrance and you know weapon reach and how armor works and so this is an attempt to sort of create for the crunchy analytical gamer mind a way of breaking down the, the rudiments of story uh, so that you can make your own game stories more interesting and fun. And how did you, I mean, how did you come to the project? Where did this all start off? Uh, it started on my blog uh, for, uh, I guess, about a year and a half. I sort of broke down Hamlet uh, three or four beats at a time uh, with every Friday entry. Turns out when you go through every beat in Hamlet uh, three beats at a time, uh, it takes a long time. Um, Initially, I was interested actually in the branch points of the story. If it was a role-playing story, where would it go in different directions? But quickly, as I was going through it, I realized that what I was really interested in was the emotional flow of the story, how it goes up and down, where the emotional up points are and the down points are, and what the different moments are and how they're there and, and how they're constructed. And so you can still go back on my blog and see the sort of nascent version of what became Hamlet's hit points and then if you're a super keener you can then compare it to the way it turned out in the book after discovering what I was really on about. And were there a lot of changes? Did you really go back and revise it a lot when you brought it to the book? It, it is a revised version. Uh, it sort of established itself through the course of doing Hamlet. So at about a third of the way through I was already kind of discovered what I was doing. I also found when I, for the book, went to look at Dr. No and Casablanca, a few other beat types that weren't as readily apparent in Hamlet as they are in those stories, and then, you know, reincorporated that in, into Hamlet. So you can see an evolution, even though it's, def it's still the same thing. There's a lot of discussion in uh, Hamlet's hit points uh, of the either procedural uh, narrative versus dramatic narrative, and how those two interrelate. Uh, what, I mean, what did that what did you really feel about how this applied to role-playing as a, as a game and as a type of storytelling? Something we do really well in role-playing is the procedural story the, uh, in which the hero is tackling an external obstacle. So it's you know, running away from the giant boulder that's coming to crush you or fighting the orcs or trying to climb a, a, a mountain or es escape from a, a, an enemy in a car or whatever. Um, what we don't do so well are the dramatic moments, the moments where uh, characters are trying to achieve something internal and relating to other characters and seeking emotional change in state either from that other character or within themselves. So that in a role-playing game as, as currently stands, when particularly two-player characters have a dramatic interchange, it doesn't work the way that it does in a dramatic work, whether that be The Graduate or Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, or There Will Be Blood, where the characters mm. over time have to change and shift in reaction to one another because they have emotional needs that they need to get from each other. Well, we don't do that much in role-playing, so what happens is player one states his case, player two states his case, and then they just dig in, and there's no forward development. Mm. And so what I'm evolving toward, and this may be you know, the next book or a follow-up book or maybe a little game project, is creating the rules that would allow you to create dramatic interchanges in your games the way that you know, we do procedural really well, and dramatic is something we still haven't quite developed. So the idea that there's sort of no skill check for having a personal epiphany. Exactly. Um, and you, you have no rules incentive uh, to really need anything emotionally from other players or, or NPCs. Uh, we, we have a little bit of that, but the structure, nobody's quite done that yet.
Now, it seems to me like uh, Greg Stolze uh, really tried to approach that idea with A Dirty World, his uh, noir-themed uh, variation on the one-world engine, where you have this idea of people uh, being able to attack each other's attributes, and, you know, the, the idea that there is an actual push-pull that can go on in a dramatic interchange between two characters. Uh, was that sort of something that approached on what you were going for, or do you feel like there's a, a different area that's sort of untapped there? I, I think what he's doing there is something very interesting, which is taking the dramatic beats and treating them mechanically the way that you traditionally would treat procedural beats. So it's like, well, let's make this into an emotional fight scene. And uh, I think there's something in that, but it's still, um, that's a, uh, a perfectly valid, I have to say, way of taking what we've already got in role playing and then applying it to the way drama works. What I'm interested in doing is taking the way drama works and applying it to role playing. And I don't yet know how much that will differ from what Greg came up with. Something that's still sort of, in, you know, pitating in your brain, essentially. Uh, yeah, and, and it's sort of based on the way that actors break down scenes uh, when they uh, interpret a, a text, whether it be in a film scene or uh, in a play, you, they sort of break it down into beats where they're shifting tactics, so they know what they want from the other person. So if we were having a dramatic interchange, you know, I might really strongly want to impress you uh, with the idea that I'm some kind of genius, whereas you may be, you know, seeking some other sort of validation from me or you, you may secretly want to attack and diminish me and then there would be a series of tactics that we would both employ and then there would be some level of resolution to that and, and there would also probably be uh, a way that the, that occurs over a series of scenes so the first scene might just be the statement of each person's positions and then there might be a scene that recapitulates that and then the third scene something's got to change and there has to be a reason to make that happen mechanically but that's you know as you said something that's just gestating in my brain at this mm -hmm. point I mean, you talked earlier about the idea that you know story essentially sort of came into role playing through the back door. I mean, I'm assuming you're referring to because the uh, you know the evolution of chain mail into uh, D into D and D, you know, starting out as a war game and then moving into something that was very procedural in nature, and then people starting to develop this idea of you know evolving into the characters. Looking at the role playing industry in general, where it's come from, you know, kind of you know from Gary Gygax's you know early days, uh, where do you see you know where do you see most of the role playing industry standing in that sort of stuff? You know, how has the use of story and character evolved, and how has it affected the evolution of role playing as a genre? Well, obviously, we've seen a huge explosion in the storytelling area through the indie movement, uh, which is basically a, a movement of game design that came out of the uh, sector of players slash GMs who are really interested in story and storytelling. And they, you know, have developed a master narrative around what they're doing, as well as creating a series of really interesting dramatic narratives. And they're... Uh, typically look for super specialized uh, ways of evoking a very, very particular emotional experience in whatever game. And there's part of, partly that's because of the incentive of the way that the indie game market works, where you have one small chapbook game that is your new game for the year. And so there's incentive to, you know, have it be, you know, these super little kernels of things that are very, very, very specific. Mm. Um, and uh, now we're seeing that filter back through into what you would think of as more traditional or mainstream games. So, for example, Smallville uh, has a huge influence from the various uh, interpersonal games, uh, relationship building games that came out of indie, and now that's filtering back up into, you know, you expect, you know, a licensed game from, from a company like Margaret Weiss Productions to be, you know, very traditional, and here's our latest iteration of our things for this big entertainment license. But no, they've taken this... System with yeah, yeah. Um, but they've taken this really interesting relationship mapping mm -hmm. system. And so we're now at a really interesting point where all of these little separate kernels of ideas that have developed in this hothouse lab of the indie movement are now flowing back out into more traditional games. So I think that's a really interesting moment of cross-pollinization that, you know, may address what was kind of becoming a bit of stagnation in the indie movement, and now I think it's moving in an interesting, new, exciting direction again. And seeing similar things with, uh, say, White Wolf's uh, introduction of, you know, humanity mechanics into uh, Vampire, uh, you know, the use of the limit break in Exalted, where you have that kind of uh, a, a, a more social aspect, and, and indeed, the, generally, the social mechanics in Exalted, we have the idea of being able to uh, persuade another person around to your point of view in a scene which is just as dramatic as a fight scene in a lot of ways. Exactly, and you know, I've I've had other uh, designs myself that have uh, tended in that direction. That the Hero Wars slash Hero Quest rules treat a debate scene or a, a scene of 
a personal interaction mechanically the sa exactly the same as a fight scene, that every conflict is resolved in the same way so that you can have a big, exciting, uh, climactic moment at the end of your game that's not a fight, it's a, you know, a presentation before the Viking parliament or, or whatever. The moment where the evidence is brought out and the traitor is revealed. Right, and it has the same uh, structure of give and take, and it, it's not just one role as, as traditionally uh, emotional or persuasion Make roles. Make check. Yeah, and it's, it's a series of checks and has the same sort of ebb and flow and, mm -hmm. and excitement as you would expect from a fight scene.